Welcome to Extra Takes, hosted by Northland Church Lead Pastor Dr. Joshua Laxton. Join us each week as Pastor Josh reveals the rest of the story behind his sermons. We'll discuss how those who follow Christ can live out a biblical vision for the church in our world today. Well, hello, Northland family and friends. Welcome to another episode of Extra Takes. I am your co-host alongside a mother co-host the other side, Matt Shiles. How you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, so we're coming later. We so are. So we're Sorry. probably a day day later in terms of at least posting this because we have been out of town. All of the executive staff have uh, been out of town. We had our like mid year retreat, so it was it was wonderful. But we got away and we did some retreat type things. We uh, did. So yeah. that's my first question. Oh. So before we dig in, let's let's just do that now. So. Okay. Uh, explain to us on a high level well, why we got away and what we did. Yeah, so every you know, so every year we ask the staff to create a ministry action plan, and then what we all, and then I also create a ministry action plan. Mm-hmm. And what we wanted to do this this retreat is we just kind of wanted to touch base, like get mm-hmm. kind of put our finger on the pulse of where everyone is at. Uh, also making sure that we understand our organizational charts because we are a growing church and there's a, yeah. and as you grow your your org chart does take iterations and so one of the things that we wanted to do this go round is have everybody org chart out their division or their arm so that we can see what they're thinking of right now and then even another step or two ahead like what where, where are they wanting to go because if you if you don't project out where where you're wanting to go, um, and then in light of where you are, uh, you just begin to make, in some sense, random decisions about staffing. Yeah. And so so that's what we wanted to do. And then also I wanted to do some leadership lessons. We did uh, two, well, really, I guess three big ones. I was, I was really focusing on two, but I added a third. And those leadership lessons were you need to start viewing leadership as a game of chess, not checkers. And we talked through what that means. Then we talked about this idea of crisis uh, leadership and how if um, – you know, we, we talked about this whole idea of endurance training again. We talked about the zones, and I was talking about how if you're in zone four in a leadership scenario, now zone four is a zone of pain. So zone four, zone five, uh, zones of pain. Mm. Uh, zone four is what they call threshold. You can kind of keep that pace uh, for, for a little bit of time, but but not a, a long period of time. So so when you do like a threshold run, and what, where this all came about is I did a threshold run uh uh, at, on Tuesday morning, and I started having pain in my side, mm. and I've had that before, and they call it stitch pain, you know. But but you, you're getting to this point where you're like, okay, well I'm in pain, I, but I, but I but I know this pain, yeah. and I know I can kind of work through it because yeah. I only got three minutes left, yeah. you know. So, but if you apply that to leadership, and you don't, if you're not aware of where you are, and you feel this pain, you begin to make gut decisions. Mm-hmm. In a crisis moment, and when you make a gut decision in a crisis moment, it's either going to land in a freeze decision, flight decision, or fight decision. And so, therefore, when you are in an organizational crisis, and and what we talked about is that we're in a turnaround period here at Northland, yeah. and that it is a crisis. Like you know, people might not, you know, even people listening to this, you might not necessarily feel like it is a crisis mode. You're like, why is it like? But you have to understand that from 2009 to 2017. The church went from uh, over ten thousand on average uh, down to around twenty, you know, twenty five, twenty six uh, hundred on average. Then when I got here, it was less than seven hundred mm. on average. And you just think about all of the transition, and then uh, you know, to to really lead that turnaround and all of the things that have to happen that that are part of that turnaround that that's part of that cri- you know some says part of that crisis leadership and so you're doing the same amount of ministry with less people less resources and so that that adds some stress that adds crisis so yeah. so that's where you know and then we talked about you know management leadership versus executive leadership because they're different now you, you know uh, you, all all leaders are 
are uh, of the when I say the same value in essence. Just like as a human being, we're we're all endowed with the same amount of dignity uh, and, and value and worth. But but when it comes to management leadership versus executive leadership, there's different roles and responsibilities. And so you need to understand the difference between the the two so that you can make good staffing decisions. So so that's what we did. I mean, that's, like, again, I guess maybe, maybe we're talking about leadership early on, but that's yeah. what we did. And then, um, and then just given that kind of, uh, you, you know, green, yellow, red of where they are on their ministry action plan. And then I would say a big, huge chunk of the retreat too is just spending time together. Like I, I really, really tried to stress with the staff is that we, we are just not Mm -hmm. uh, work partners, uh, we're ministry partners. Uh, so it's not like we just have a work relationship that's Mm -hmm. transactional. Oh, we got to work with these people every day. No, no. Like we have to be like, we have, and I I stress this, we have to be, we must be family partners in gospel ministry because if we don't, if we don't demonstrate and embody a partnership of gospel ministry that is embedded and rooted in the sense of family it's going to be hard for that to be demonstrated in other areas of not only our staff mm-hmm. life, but more importantly, even our 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 church life. So, so we had fun. So there was serious times and fun times and prayerful times and yeah, all that. Yeah, we la- we laughed a lot. We uh, we learned a lot. Had a lot of presentations and um, yeah, it was a wonderful. Wonderful couple days. Good. Um, so thanks for sharing that as I was um, as I was experiencing it and uh, then thinking about extra takes. I just, I know um, so much of our, our congregation, you know, lives this day in and day out in their work life. Yeah. And um, with the structures and systems and leadership development. So um, I thought to, to give a little bit of a glimpse of, of what we did the last few days would be, uh, would be hopefully helpful and, and encouraging as well. Um, so this week we are in our Empowered series. We are winding down our series, uh, but this was called Faith on Trial. And we were in Acts 23, 24, 25, and 26. It's May 4th and 5th. So the main point is faith is on trial and should be determined true or false, right or wrong, based on one's execution of justice. So this idea, idea of faith on trial and this idea of of justice and what is just and right and wrong. Um, and just to kind of set this up, part of the setup um, was your faith is producing something. It's proclaiming something. What you perceive to be just or right, setting something right that went wrong. And uh, something else you said was the outcome of your faith will show you if your faith is right or wrong, true or false. So the outline we had was we talked about this idea of trials and, and justice. You laid out the five elements of faith, and then you used the, that, that chart, the five elements of faith, to really look at a couple of different things. You looked at the Jews and put them on trial uh, and gave us some takeaways. You looked at Paul, uh, his faith on trial with some takeaways, and finally Jesus' life on trial. Mm. So as you began... Um, you you said, I'm going to ask you to ask the Spirit to give you insight, uh, which I thought was a an interesting thing to say. It really struck me because you you know specifically you said you got to really put your thinking cap on, and uh, wanted to to challenge us in that way. Um, but just just my take on that, I I think we need to be confronted with this more and more. In our busy not in their busy life, I was just struck that like we need to be slowed down. Mm. And on on the weekends, on Saturday, on Sunday, I get the sense that um, even the regular, consistent, you know, three four times a month, regular all the time, like we can still get caught in this. Is this just part of our routine and are we just doing this kind of drive by thing? Um, that's just part of our busy of our busy life. So um so where did where did that idea come from? Just um I think that's probably a a, a thought and a hope 
for every week, but specifically this week, you said. For the, for the Spirit to give us insight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm stating in some sense what I'm assuming all the time is like yeah. the Spirit's got to give you eyes to see, ears to hear. I mean, I, you know, I've been praying that prayer recently. Yeah, it's not an unusual thing. It sounds kind of obvious, but it, it yeah. hit me that you would actually like say that to us. Yeah, well, because I want, you know, I, this is where like for for me pre, you know preaching isn't isn't a performance thing. Mm-hmm. It really like it it is not like so if it was more of a performance thing then I I I'm I'm going to be thinking differently. Mm. For, for me, the aim of preaching is transformation, mm. but only God brings about transformation. And Preaching for the aim of transformation, I I wrote an article years ago about this, is that it's information plus application in the context of community. Mm. And so if God has called me to pastor, one of the predominant ways that I do that is through the teaching ministry. Yeah. Now, contextually... You, you know, more people are going to be present and engage in the, the the corporate worship environment. So we got less people involved in life groups than we do corporate worship. Yeah. And so you know, it just is what it is. Um, and so, but but the corporate worship setting is the predominant teaching where you dispense mm-hmm. the Bible. And so, for me, it isn't this weekend kind of event, spiritual event that people come to. It literally is the corporate worship yeah. of, the, of the saints coming together to hear from our King. Yeah. And so, therefore, when you know when I'm when I'm developing something, I'm not developing for performance. I'm like. You know, we were talking about what I was developing for for this week. Is yeah. like I'm really trying. Like I'm asking, I'm asking Lord, seeing, okay, okay, what is it saying? But okay, but how? Do, like how does it now translate to my life? Yeah. With the hope that through the Spirit it will bring about transformation. So, um, and so that's why I'm, I'm big on trying to, if I can create a framework or create a chart to help explain this, like yeah. almost like, so in all honesty, almost view it as if you're going to school. Okay. Okay. So we've all been in school. Mm-hmm. And when we're in elementary, we go to school, you know, six, seven hours a day and we, you know, go to our subjects, you know, whether it's, you know, 30, 45 minutes an hour. And then, and then you grow. And then even when we go to, Whenever we go to college and the graduate school and like get a bit like you're sitting in classes learning and you're seeing, OK, how do I take this and, 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 and actually do it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's the way I view corporate worship is that it's not just giving you a little trinket. It's not just hopefully making you feel good and fu- warm and fuzzy. It's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. like I believe with all of my heart that I am opening up the inerrant, infallible word of God. And, and that God has talked to me that week about that particular passage, trying to understand it, yeah. and then to translate it in such a way as 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 the Spirit of God brings transformation. Which yeah. sometimes, you know, I mean, it it just takes time for yeah. for that to develop. And I yeah. need people, and I and I hope and pray like like I you know I want us to be a church that is built upon the Word, not a performance. Like, Amen. Um, and so. Um, and I understand, you know, and it's always funny to hear what other pastors say about things or that. But but here's the thing: this is what God has shared with me, hmm. um, you, you know, of what. And this is part of where you always have to figure out, okay, what is the purpose? Hmm. And this is what I really believe. Like, you, you know, again, I, the predominant place where most people will be is on the weekend. Yep. Now, you know, I I have my made for mission time and that's fun mm-hmm. and I think people get a lot out of those made for, you know the 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 made for mission yeah. settings that we've had because we do 3 hours and we do basically two and a half hours of Bible study. Yeah. Which again is teaching like I yeah. love teaching the Bible but I not only do I love teaching the Bible, I more so actually love when people learn the Bible. <laughs> you know, and, and they go, "Oh my gosh, that yes." Yeah. But but here's Here's the thing. If you're hungry, yeah, like your appetite will determine your consumption. So if you're really not, I mean, so if you're really not hungry for the things of God, you're gonna be bored out of your mind with me. And if you're not hungry for truth, you, you, you eventually you might not come. But your appetite, and that's tweetable there. See, that's where I feel it like is. the Spirit of God gives me give, gives me those things. Like I wasn't thinking about that when I came here. Yeah. But here's the thing: your appetite will determine your consumption. Uh, because here's the thing. Here's what I know. When I'm hungry, 
I'm going to consume some food. I'm actually going to consume maybe an appetizer, um, a main entree, and if yeah. I'm feeling froggy, I'm going to put away a dessert. Why? Yeah. Because my appetite will determine my consumption. If you, the hungrier you are for God, the more you want to consume Him. So let's drill down on that. Um, where does that hunger come from? Cheers. Um, where did well? I mean, so here's what I actually believe. So because the the listeners and viewers, we are all at different spectrums of that, and we go through dry spells, we go through you know, like certainly the majority of people that are listening now have some sort of hunger. Well, here's what, yeah, but wait, wait. but that won't always be the case. So here's the question I would say: Who's feeding your hunger? Because we're all hungry as human beings. But here's the thing: if you don't have an appetite for the Lord, that means you're trying to feed yourself in other ways. Because you are feeding yourself or being fed in other ways. Yeah. We always are. Yeah, because that's where I'm like the whole idea of dependency. We don't really know anything about here you know, in America because we in some sense have everything. We just might not have enough of what we think we need. You know, we need a bigger car or we need a more expensive car, you know, yeah. driving, you know and it, or we need a bigger house or I need, you know, I mean, my, my $70,000 uh, you know, salary is enough. I need a hundred thousand dollars, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And so, so in some sense, whatever you're, you're feeling, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to satisfy your hunger in some way, yeah. but that's part of where the, the, the idea of a hunger for God is. Okay. So if, if, if the Lord is, is sovereign and in control of every area of my life, then therefore I'm going to be hungry and go, all right, what am I going to hear today that applies to some area of my life that allows the Lord to fill that void or to fill that satisfaction? Hmm. You know, but in some sense, if you feel like you already know it all, you feel like in some sense things are fine, you just want to come and hear like just, a, you know, again, maybe you might just want to hear a little sermonette or you might go, I don't even necessarily need church. You know, because I'm, in some sense, I'm good. Yeah. So, so that's where I'm saying, like, your hunger for truth, your hunger for the Lord, uh, will determine your consumption. Yeah. And if you find yourself, you know, lacking in that way, there there may be some things you need to starve in your life. Well, yeah, because well, think about it, like, so uh, I mean, we've all done this. Like, we've you know, we know dinner's coming, but we're so hungry, and so we have a snack. Yeah. And so, so here, here's the thing: the Lord wants to feed you. The Lord's making you a wonderful meal, mm. multiple ways. Mm. You know, He's making a, a wonderful meal devotionally. If you want to consume Him there, He's definitely Lord willing making a wonderful meal on the weekend yeah. uh, through your pastor. He's making a wonderful meal through life group leaders. I mean, uh, all along the way, the Lord is working through uh, His people and through resources to deliver you a meal. But if you're, you're you know, if you're you're constantly filling it with stuff that you're trying to produce on your own, then when you come to that meal table, you're not hungry. You might pick at it. That's good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So. And that just came out. It will. I am a little stuff. tired, though, so I don't know. What you, so that's where I'm like, oh, where does that come from? Uh, the Spirit of God gives you insight and wisdom. Oh, I I love it. And, and to that point, um, as you were talking about preaching, I think one of the things I would also add to that is if is if you do view it and if we do view it as school and learning um i don't know about you but but me i i can't remember much so if i'm not writing it down i'm not learning much so like you you need to you need to know what works best for you but like i think there's a lot of us out there that just listening and consuming the message and not taking any sort of notes driving home after the sermon, you might not even be able to recall the well, main points. Well, that's because, again, this goes back to even your learning. Uh, which way do you learn best? I mean, yeah. so some people are audio listeners. Actually, very few people just can, in some sense, absorb a lot of audio and in some sense take something, you know, mm. which is why I usually, well, this is why I give you a main point. I, yeah. What did he talk about? He talked about some some something about justice. Yeah. You, you know that yeah. it, that your faith is like you, you know showing you what you believe about justice. You yeah. Know? So I'm yeah. trying to give you at least a main point, main idea that oh, it's about justice. Okay. So, but again, most people aren't fully audio listeners. They're mm. visual, mm. you know, and uh, sometimes they got to write it down. I mean, so however you learn best, but just know this is that we can worship. That's a time for you to learn. Yeah. 
As for a time for you to come and hear from the king. And I'm not the king. So by the way, I'm not saying come come hear from me. No, I'm just a vessel. I'm just a conduit by which the king speaks. Yeah. And so depend you know, so however you learn, if you learn by taking notes, if you learn and then some people uh, they'll they'll sit through it and listen, then they'll go back and listen to it with a pen and paper. Like yeah. however you do it. But here's the thing. What are you hungry for? Mm. What are you hungry for? Mm. Uh, because that's going to determine your consumption. Mm. So. so we did the the five elements of faith. So if this is the first time someone has seen this diagram, what do you what do you want them to know? And then the follow up to that, if it's if it's one of us that have seen it over and over, um, what might you want us to know? So first time seeing it and multiple times. Well, yeah, first time seeing it, just digest it. You know, I mean, and again, it like so. This this framework is almost it's like a when I say a a a a, a, a specific breakdown mm. like of faith. Mm. So the totality of faith. So that's why I want you know. So yeah, it's kind of like the Kentucky Derby this past weekend. I think it was a nose finish. So I mean, they had they had to zoom in like one of the. Closest finishes of all yeah, time. They had to zoom in to see, who, like, so this is a zoom in uh, of faith, okay. you know. So yeah. I don't want people to think that it's separate. No, these are all like they 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 work in conjunction with one another. Mm. So that's why I, I, I want you to see that. That's why I put it in a framework, one framework, five elements of faith. Yeah. And so again, understand what faith is, believe, confidence, trust in. So, so, and your center will will give will, will give you understanding to all of these things. That's why I put the center in the center. Yeah. So it's going, you know, your center is going to form your worldview, your yeah. mission, your ethics, how you live, what do you see is right, what do you see is wrong, mm. and then your maturation process. Mm. Like, what are the things that you got to do mm. that are on you to mature? In your faith, to mature mm. in your ethics, to mature in a, um, a deeper understanding of worldview, a deeper understanding of like, so, so, so that's why I would want you to, you know, and then that would go for people who have saw it for the first time, or people like, I, I, I don't want you to dismiss it and go, oh, that's, you know, no, I mean, like, yeah, because what you in because the 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 message that I introduced this on, because this is the message that, or I was teaching a leadership class a couple of years ago and and right before as I was developing material I'm like and it was around Peter and why he cut off somebody's ear mm. and so that was the first time I developed uh, that okay is because he had he he, he had this worldview um and he had this mission and this ethics and and in some sense Jesus was the center but it was uh, it was he misunderstood how the messiah was going to come and conquer and get victory mm-hmm. so Jesus the first time he came he was going to conquer through suffering giving his life yeah yeah and so in Peter's mind his faith his again his trust and confidence was in Jesus but he thought as most Jews did that the Messiah would come and overthrow the Romans so which is why he pulls out his sword right and, so and he was putting faith in Jesus as the conquering king not as the suffering servant. Yes, mm. and, and and so and that's where your faith, like your faith, mm. it, it it does have major ramifications to how you view the world, to what you perceive, and that's why his mission was: I'm going to join him on overthrowing right. the the empire. And my ethics is that whoever gets in my way, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna slash them. Yeah. Uh, and so, hmm. yeah, so so th- that's where it first started. And then I've just really tried to, you know, develop more and more of an understanding. And then it was also where we talked about uh, Peter and Cornelius mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. earlier on in Acts chapter 10. I put mm-hmm. to get, you know, I put this framework up. So, and I try to show it quite, you know, again, quite often when you start seeing faith in action. Yeah. Because when you start seeing really faith in action, here's where it comes from. For me, every time I see this, I'm reminded of, like, I've I've continued, I haven't got past focusing on the centerpiece, because I, I feel like in our Christian culture that it is very, very easy to say, yeah, I have faith in Jesus, but there's something else in the center. And that's where, like, I'm constantly, you know, 
uh, convicting myself, but also looking at others. Okay, if if Jesus really was in the center, then all these other things would be intertwined. But so often, Jesus is there in the picture, but he's not actually in the center. Yeah, which then goes back to the the developing of this message is that the Jews would have said Yahweh is the center, but you actually can see mm. who the center was by what they were informed to do based upon their priorities, yeah. their promises, their protection, and, yeah. what, and what they were spurred on to do in terms yeah. of what they constantly persisted yeah. in, and then how they were impatient, and then how... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so the outworking of the ethics and, and the mission, um, uh, you know, the maturity, it, it essentially helps you see what is actually in the center. Yeah, it, yeah. it shows you who's your authority. yeah. And then it actually shows your activity. Yeah, you, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so in some, yeah. So it, it, again, that's where like, and and again, in this model, it was it was just a again, it was it was taking the model and going a little bit deeper, mm-hmm. just drilling a little bit deeper in it. Mm-hmm. But but when you look at what I've what I put up there first, the five elements, beliefs are at the you know kind of at the top, the behavior. So so your beliefs now ethics. That, you know, it, it is what you believe is right and wrong, but your ethics are more behavioral. Yeah. But they're going to be informed, though, from your worldview, mission, and the center. It's going to feed that, and so it's going to come out more of your life. So so that's where beliefs and behaviors work in tandem. Again, I don't want us to separate them. I want them to. I want us to see them integrated. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. when you so when you take your faith now, mm-hmm. you're you're going to have an authority that's informing you of these things. Mm. And then you're going to have these activities that are doing these things. Mm, mm. But they, again, they work in tandem. That's the reason why I tried to show that your your priorities are tied to your persistence, what mm-hmm. you're going to be persistent in. Mm-hmm. Your promises are tied to what you're going to be patient or impatient in. Yeah. And then your protection is going to be tied into your Prudence, your wisdom, or your folly, your recklessness. Mm. Um, you, you know, so so I wanted, to, you know, and I wanted to show all of that, and that's where you had to put your thinking cap on because, yeah. you know, I I just don't think, I, and again, I I don't mean this, I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but do we really think deeply of our life? Do we, you know because it's not until sometimes people want counseling or they need actually something to happen in their life that they begin to think deeply about a subject. It, and, and I think honestly, that's why that question of the very first, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to ask the Spirit to give you insight." You were essentially recognizing that, like, "Hey, we need to slow down here," and like a lot of us, we may not slow down enough to think deeply about this. And like, you can't do it on your own, and you need the Spirit. Yeah, and this was, you know, because this would be a great message to share to someone who is far from the Lord, but. They they like justice. They want justice to be served. I mean, like, because here's the thing: leaving what's going on in you know, kind of the the uh, Middle East with Israel and, um, and Palestine, and Gaza Strip, people are wanting justice on both sides. Yeah, yeah. So, but what is just? What is yeah. justice? Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Here in America, we want justice. Okay, well, but what? And then, like, and that's where, like, if you if 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 cultures just pull out justice out of a hat, sure, there might be some justice and justness there because there there is even the concept of justice because of the image of God on our life. But if you're just conjuring up justice and making whatever you want to be just, mm. then is that really justice? Mm. <laughs> So speaking of thinking deeply, you said you have to understand what is informing your faith. You said the world, this is the world that you are building. And the principle was when we play God, we naturally usher in chaos. And this is essentially what you were talking about here with justice. When we play God, we naturally usher in chaos and thereby unravel the order and harmony in life and society. And then you said something bold about um, our nation, you said one nation under God, but it's always been God at our beck and call. We've, we've used God to placate to what we set as our priorities. Yeah, I mean, you, you really do see that throughout the history. Now, that doesn't mean that our country wasn't founded upon Judeo-Christian values. I mean, the whole, 
uh, seven, so if you think about even the enlightenment of the 17, 1800s, I mean, the, the undergirding of the enlightenment was from a Western mind rooted in Judeo-Christian values. Now, again, when you even look at the 1700 years of where, in some sense, the, the church you know, came to power in the Western world— I mean, you have a you, you you don't have a really perfect picture mm. of what it means for you, you, where for what it means for for Jesus to to rule and reign, like it, because the the church got it wrong in in many cases of of how to, but but you also have to understand the undergirding of how the church thought when they came to power. Because prior to that, you had the Roman Empire and in some sense the, the Greek you know, empire and how they ruled by force. Yeah. And so now yeah. there was this, in some sense, combination integration of, well, we, we, we got to kind of rule by force, but now we have, you know, we have this faith though that informs that we have to be somewhat gracious. And so, so it was a really mixed bag. Hmm. Um, hmm. But nevertheless... You know, when you look at the, you know, the birth of America and even, you know, 250 years, you know, later, you got both the left and the right. They all, you know, they, they like to incite, you know, what the Bible says in mm-hmm. some sense to, you know, kind of support their position. Huh. Uh, I don't like that. I mean, it is what it is, but we've been doing that since, again, uh, and even the church when when they were doing things that were pitiful and not representative of Jesus when they were in power. Well, they're like, well, you, we got to do this with the Bible. And it's kind of like, no, you can really twist the Bible. The Satan knows how to twist the Bible. So that, yeah. so that's where I was really trying to get at is like, I don't want us to be deceived as Christians that yeah. just because, you know, a political leader, you know, points to scripture or is like, well, you know, God bless America as if God is really the center of what they're saying. Now, I'm not saying that every politician that would invoke doesn't have Jesus at the center of their life. But yeah. when you're looking at it from a political, a generalized perspective, political uh, viewpoint mm-hmm. is that that politicians mm-hmm. since the beginning have invoked God but God has not been the center of their faith framework and, and you had talked about how this goes back to you know this idea of playing God it go- goes back to the beginning with Adam and Eve um, and that's what the the garden was about and that's what the the tree was about and um and I think what you're touching on is the importance of us knowing the meta narrative, the grand picture of Scripture, and understanding. Because the only way we can guard against that, what you were saying, you know, proof texting, picking and choosing, is um, is to know your know the Bible, know the know the Scriptures, and and that's that's why we're talking about learning and having a part a posture of uh of humility right i i know that there are many of you that are listening and watching that have been following the lord for years like years and years and years and you have the posture of learning because you're watching today yeah that's what we're talking about that's how you know through the spirit of the lord that's how we're able to discern yeah when you know when 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 that sort of um, whether it's politics or whether it's friends or, you know, that sort of ideas come into our mind, we're able to say, well, well, hold on a second. Does that really align with this idea of faith? Does that really align with the God I know from yeah. Scripture? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just another, and, and I think I said it, but just to stress it, is the Jews played both the authority and the, the activity, and so when you play both the authority mm. and the one who is, you know, activating and living out of and actively living out of the authority, you wear yourself out. Mm. So if you're the one that's generating the priorities, if you're the one generating the promises, you're the one having to exercise out the protection, mm. you, you know, when, when, when you're doing that and not living in the protection, the promises, so that you can live out the priorities given to you, then you mm. just naturally wear yourself out. And part yeah. of the, you know, and then the other part of it is, is that, yes, you do play God and thereby you bring chaos an unraveling of order, 
uh, so forth and 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 so on. Hmm. So just know if you're kind of worn out. And again, I'm not saying like you know because again, there's times where life just wears you out. And, sure. But but if you're playing God in your life, where you're generating all of these things, and you've got in some sense hmm. actively fulfill what you've generated, you wear yourself out as opposed to living into the protection, living into the promises, so that you can live out the priorities. Yeah, that can happen to any of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another quote you said was if, and you've said this before, but it's one of my favorites. If everyone is free to do whatever they want to do, then no one is free. Yeah. You talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, you have anarchy. Like that, I mean, you just have anarchy. Is that no, like, no one's in charge. If every, so let's just say if everybody wanted to be in charge. Like, oh, we live in a free world. Everyone, you, you know, do whatever you want to. If everybody wanted to be in charge, then no one's in charge. And, and we're, living in, we're living in a society where we don't like authority. We rebel against authority. And then if we don't like the authority and they, they have some kind of oppression, which, again, throughout the history of civilization, there have been oppressive regimes. There have been oppressive governments. And I get that. But but in some sense, what what we're doing or what we're seeing over the last few years and really maybe in the last couple of decades, we just we're just rebelling against authority. We don't want to listen to our parents. We don't we don't we're skeptical of the government, which, which again, I, I get why we're skeptical of the government. But what so but what but what's the alternative? The alternative is either you, re, you know, in some sense you revolt and you, you know, you, you, you flip things over and you have this drastic, far-reaching, you know, kind of change in ways of thinking and behaving in another kind of authority. But here's what we know from authority. Like, and even with the church, when they, when they, you know, when, when they came on the scene, is that there's no perfect authority. And this is where I'll, why I'm all, you know, always like just if you look at history is that the oppressed – if they get power, they become the oppressor. I'm, mm. Like you saw, you you saw that even in the church. The church did. Mm. You know that's where th- there's some non there's some really dark spots in when I say church history of when they came to power is because they in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases became the oppressor. Mm. Mm. Okay, so so that's where I'm like, I, you, you know, so that's where I'm just saying like. That's why we got to go back. We long for another world. Our world's jacked up. And that's why I'm, I'm wanting, you know, to throw out the, just think. Now, again, I still believe in, we, we, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in the, the June series, uh, The Church and the Divided Democracy. But you, you, got, you got Romans 13, that God is still sovereign over governments. He was sovereign over the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that he's causing the, the their, you know, them to embody brokenness. They're, that's just that's just what they're embodying. But he's sovereign, which is why yeah. Jesus would tell Pontius Pilate, listen, you, know, you ain't got authority that God hasn't given you. Yeah. And sometimes authorities abuse that authority. They abuse power. It's just part, again, it's part of living in our fallen world, which is why the church, we ought to be smarter. Mm. And we ought to call out where our culture gets things wrong, where they do abuse power, where they do in you know use the name of Jesus to to in some sense placate what they want to do, like mm. what, so like that's where and, and you know it, yeah I, I I'm digressing but um yeah there, there's just a lot there I, I so I one of the reasons I like that line is um. It, it basically is a way to intellectually go on the offensive in the church for years and years and years we've been on the defensive. Yeah. But you're essentially looking at the culture and saying, okay, let's, you know, w- what's happening here? Let's, let's take this to the logical conclusion. Is that the world we want to live in? Yeah. Is that, is that the outcome? And then this idea of submission to authority, practically it's, it's one of the ways we can really, as the church, set ourselves apart. Submitting yeah. to authority. Yep. Submitting to submitting to the authority of the word, <laughs> submitting to the spirit, submitting to teacher, to teaching. Um, and I know this idea of submission gets us ooh, it gets us squirrely. We yeah, don't like well, it. Well, well, it shouldn't get us squirrely. I mean, the fact that Jesus not you know, not only submitted to the Father. 
But Jesus submitted to Pontius Pilate. You know, Jesus subjected himself to uh, mm. to injustice. Mm. Um, I mean, so so it, yeah, it gets us squirrely because we want to, you know, we want authority, we want power. Jesus turned power upside down because the the reason mm. why he has the name that is above every other name is because he he came and took a lesser name, in the sense of he took upon he took mm. upon himself flesh and humanity and became humble uh, to the point of death on a cross. So he subjected himself to injustice and abuse of power, uh, to authority that, in some sense, had already been given to them, uh, you, you know, by God. Mm. But he submitted himself. Mm. Um, you, you know, and, and Paul, same thing. He's going to submit. You know, he's going to submit himself. And so that, but that's where he can just he can trust into the protection of God. Going, okay, listen. At whatever time God wants, like whenever God wants me done, yeah. I'll be done. Yeah. Uh, but until then, I ain't got. I ain't got to worry. I don't have to fight like hell. Yeah. You, you know, because I'm I'm not living out my own protection and the promises that I've generated. I can live. I can submit myself. Now here's you know, and here's the other thing. I mean, so so they submitted themselves, but but they also ex, you know um, exhibited civil disobedience mm, mm-hmm. in the you know in the sense of any time that the authorities told the church that you cannot do this if if that command you cannot do this if it infringed upon the command or commands that God had given them they would enact civil disobedience and the subjection though to the punishment of the governing authorities yeah so that's another, you know, and again, that, that that's just another side of how we actually. I mean, there's another side of how we allow our faith to play out. Yeah. In those in those situations. Yeah. So the uh, the last question I have, and then we'll see if you have any other um, thoughts on any of these diagrams. But um, you had you had issued an apology uh, to anybody that's been hurt or deceived by either. False Christians or imperfect Christians. You said, "Don't look at them; look at him." Mm. So, can you can you unpack this idea of false Christians or imperfect Christians? Because they are very different. <laughs> and my question to us is, can we discern the difference? Um, but just having those two together in the same sentence was just such a stark contrast to me. So, I'd love for you to to talk about that: false Christians or imperfect Christians. <laughs> Can you discern the two? Um, theoretically, yes, but m- probably not in the moment. So we really? know. Well, we know Matthew thirteen, parable of the sower, mm-hmm. the soils. So you can you can have a you can have a moment where you just you blew it. Um, mm. like Peter had a moment. So so think about it. So Judas had a moment. Betrayed Jesus. Peter yeah. had a moment. Betrayed Jesus. Yeah. What's the difference? The heart. Mm. So, so that's where I'm like, you can. We're imperfect, so we're going to blow it. You may have, you know. So your kid, who's older now, may have been turned off because, in some sense, you blew it. Uh, maybe you blew it for a couple of years. I don't know. Uh, maybe you, you you lost your temper. I, I again, I, I don't. But you're in. Imp- perfection as a believer really impacted them and it you know it was like I don't have anything to do with Jesus mm. um but maybe your false faith where you, you you just said that you believed in Jesus but there was never even any try to attempt to practice mm. and so so in some sense you you brought your family to church but but nothing it didn't change the way you live Hmm. Okay, well that that could have affected your your kids too. Yeah. Um and and then you apply those kinds of scenarios to work or neighboring um, whatever it may be. So that's where I'm like so in the moment you may not can tell the difference over time you would be able to tell the difference whether or not 
they were false Christians or imperfect Christians because we're all imperfect. So at some point we're going to blow it. At some point we're going to make a mistake. At some point we're going to sin, and and that's what it means. But you can you blow it, um, and that does affect people. So, but that's where I want people to realize: like, if you've ever been hurt by by a church, if you've ever been hurt by a Christian, I really am sorry. If you ever been hurt by me, I'm sorry uh, because I know I'm imperfect. That's where I'm like, don't look at the person, look at Jesus. Um, and, and let him speak. Like there's this, there's this guy I've been listening to. He was, he was an atheist, but as he really studied the life of Jesus, uh, it looks like he has been transformed um, and had some kind of, you know, transformation uh, or conversion, exp- you know, kind of experience where he's seen. Okay, Jesus is he really is who he said he was, mm. and. But but part of that earlier part of his life, he was turned off by what he saw from Christians. Yeah. So I, I so I get that. I think I think we talked. Did we talk about the the Brennan Manning quote that the single greatest cause of atheism in the world is Christians who profess Jesus with their lips but deny him with their life. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, hmm. But yeah, I mean, so that's where I just. I was uh, sorry, but hey, l- look at Jesus. Don't look at the church. Is that too tall of a task to ask others? Don't don't look at us. Look at Jesus, because we should be transformed. Well, so, so like 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 the world should be able to look at her church. Yeah, and that's part of where like even even part of the whole idea of your trial on faith or your faith on trial. Because all of us, yeah, all of us, be- because people are you, you know you are giving witness. Of what you say is your faith. By what we do. By what we do. By what we say, what we do. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. When. Hmm. So when, when I'm looking at the, the like, so and w- when I'm looking at the fact that, that churches and believers have been the cause of, in some sense, disbelief, mm-hmm. even deconstruction. Mm-hmm. That yeah, I mean yeah, you you do like he calls us to be witnesses, but that's where I would want to go one more step and go okay. So if you've been hurt, don't take them at face value of what they have been giving witness to. Mm. There is enough facts in history for you to actually go and and investigate yourself, just like Luke did. Luke's going out on an investigation, yeah. and he's investigating himself. Mm. He's finding eyewitnesses. Uh, he's hearing from them mm. uh, about this this man who was Jesus from Nazareth, and what he said, what he did, what ha- like so. So he's inve- there. There truly are an, enough sources mm-hmm. for for you to go investigate yourself. So that's where I'm like, you know, if you've been turned off, if you've been hurt because you've looked at the church or you've looked at, you know, Christians and seen what they've said and and did and it's turned you off, just go to the original source and and compare him to them and act, because you go to the original, that's the original. Uh, the, yeah. the, 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 you, you know, when you go to the original, you'll you'll see the differences. You'll see the counter. Which is why I'm, yeah, which is why I'm saying, yeah. 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 And that's where hopefully for church, for, for Christians, like we ought to be growing in our faith mm-hmm. where we do not project a counterfeit faith, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is part of the reason why it goes back all the way back to the teaching moment, too, is that we have so watered down Jesus in our context. Mm. Mm. We have so made him less important than what he really is. We've so made, in some sense, the Bible um, less than what it truly should be. Mm. Which is why, like, we we just gotta we just gotta recover what it truly means to be the church. Mm. What it truly means to have faith in Jesus. And again, I hope that people realize, once again, I'm not stressing that that's perfection. Mm-hmm. That's faithfulness. So when you blow it, you say, man, I blew it. And, and, that, and then I'm back on, like, I'm, I'm back. Like, pursue, you know, kind of pursuing him. Mm. Um, so that, that, that's what I'm really trying to get at, probably. Yeah, we are not after perfection. We're after faithfulness. 
and and, and God works through our faithfulness. But I I do like again. That's I'm not saying every Christian. I'm not saying every church. But there's been a lot of unfaithfulness going on uh, here in America for quite some time. And the world is calling us out on it. So that's all the questions I have for you. Did you have anything else um, that you wanted to make sure we we uh, talked about before we wrap up for today? No, I mean, the thing that I would end with is... So the last 10, 12 minutes of the message was really setting up communion mm. because I wanted to take this concept of what we saw demonstrated both through Jews and yeah. Paul yeah. and actually look at the life of Jesus and how ultimately his life was God's generous justice in the world. Mm. Mm. So the reason why Jesus had to come was because every human being was marked by God's wrath, judgment, and the punishment was death, eternal separation, eternal death from the Lord. So if he's going to enact justice, it now has to be generous. Mm -hmm. So the reason why Jesus came was to be the substitutionary atonement meaning that he's going to atone for our sin, pay for our sin by taking our place. Mm. So so that's why if you're like if you're watching, I mean the scales of of creation they they, they were mm. they, they, they were imbalanced because of sin. But God is a God of justice, he's got to set things right. Yeah. But in setting things right, he had to 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 save us, he he had to send his son, which is why Paul would say in Romans 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us mm-hmm. so that he could balance out the scales. And I think, and I actually had somebody come come up to me like, man, I never thought of that, that, you know, like, because we, you know, we do communion all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is where there, there's so many different facets that you can look at various, you know, uh, various passages, various theological topics and communion being one of them and again because normally when we do communion we're not doing a sermon fully on communion Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. you're you're constantly trying to tie in really the story to communion Um, and so and because we were on justice this was a really really great way Mm. to try to tie in this idea of justice and now generous justice to to mm. our lives because what you see with Paul mm. is actually generous justice and practice because the reason why he could be patient in light of injustice we, because Jesus was mm. Mm. the reason why he can be prudent mm. even in the midst of crisis going on in his life because of Jesus was you, you know and so yeah. he can live a generous he can live a uh, generous, just life because that's what his king did. Mm. And actually, that's what his king demands right now. Why? Mm. Because there's this promise that is embedded into the that, that that is accompanied with the protection that one day Jesus will come back and fully re fully restore, making all things new. So writing every wrong. And so Paul, he doesn't have to take that into his own hand. Right. He, he's going to live into, okay, the promise is, is that, okay, even if I die to be absent from the body, be present with the Lord, but also believe mm. that one of these days Jesus will come back a second time mm. and that he will set everything right that went wrong. Mm. So I, I, don't, I, I, can, I, can, I can pursue generous justice knowing that at a... At a fixed time, somewhere in the future, that he does not know when, mm. Jesus will make all things new, set all you know, set 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 right everything that went wrong. Mm. So he can live out that priority now of just being a witness. So he yeah. that's what he can be persistent in that. 
He can, he, so he not only has to be, you, you know, persistent in that, but he can be patient in that, and he can be prudent in his mm. behaviors, living out with wisdom, mm. because he knows that God is just and is sovereign in his justness and in his execution of justice. Amen. This has been a, a really good, authentic conversation. I would ing- encourage you, um, share this with others, if this resonated with you. I I think this would be uh, a helpful message um, for those far from God, for those uh, searching, uh, and also uh, believers of of all all levels of of faith, whether whether Jesus is in the center or uh, maybe somewhere on the periphery. So Mm. I think we'll We'll leave it there today. There. Well, thanks, Matt. Well, thanks so much, North and family and friends, for joining and joining us for another episode of Extra Takes. Until next time, blessings. Thanks for listening to Extra Takes. Be sure to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you won't miss a single episode. 